On to our play, Act One of Thirteen Rue Madeleine, starring Robert Montgomery as Bob Sharkey, Lloyd Nolan as Gibson, Richard Conte as Bill O'Connell, and Vanessa Brown as Suzanne. Not until Pearl Harbor did the United States fully realize how frighteningly effective had been the espionage machines of Japan and Germany. Shortly after this disaster, we established a secret espionage service, the first in our history. As the man most capable of organizing the United States Intelligence Corps, an attorney from St. Louis was selected, Charles S. Gibson. I accepted the appointment largely because of the men who would be working with me. Men like Robert Emmett Sharkey of St. Paul, Minnesota. Master of five languages, Robert Sharkey was twice captured by the Germans in World War I, escaping each time with a brilliant record of achievement behind enemy lines. Starting in 1942, with Sharkey's help, we trained and sent overseas 76 groups of agents. Then came Group 77, each a member, a volunteer for hazardous duties behind enemy lines. In the group were men like Pappy Simpson. George T. Simpson, age 47, British Intelligence Office, World War I. Twelve years, professor of English literature at Dartford College. The majority were much younger. Take Jeff Lasseter, for instance. Born in Bern, Switzerland, 1920, son of the United States Council. Educated at Geneva and Oxford. Recruited from officers' training school, can speak French fluent. There were three women in Group 77. One was Suzanne de Beaumont. I am a citizen of France. I found myself stranded in the United States when my country came under the Nazi domination in 1940. My husband is a captain of the artillery in the French army. I have had no word of him in over four years. There was Bill O'Connell, graduate Rutgers University. Eight years in the Foreign Department in Washington, National Bank. Was in Europe two years prior to Hitler's march into Poland. Returned to New York in 1939. Twenty-two of them all told, and their training commenced in one of those secluded country estates not far from Washington. The day they arrived, I got together with Robert Sharkey. Well, they look all right to me, Gib. How much time will I have with them? Three months indoctrination. Two weeks practical exercises. I wish I could make it longer, but I can't. They'll be ready. Oh, uh... One of your pupils speaks German. Good. He can speak German because he's a German agent. A German agent? Mm. Here? You're sure? Yes. Man or woman? Well, I want you to find that out for yourself. Let me know when you think you've spotted him. Is that all? That's all. For now. Thanks. Well, I'll get to work. May I have your attention, ladies and gentlemen? You all know why you're here. First, I must remind you that everything you learn, everything you do, is secret. Not even your closest relative can know you're an agent of Group 77. Maybe no one will ever know. That's not important. But keeping your mouth shut is important. You'll have a lot to remember and a couple of things to forget. Forget the rules. Forget sportsmanship. No secret agent is a hero or a good sport. That is, no living agent. You're going to be taught to kill to cheat, to lie, and everything you learn is directed toward one objective, just one, the success of your mission. Fair play is out. Years of decency and honest living, forget all that or get out now because the enemy can forget and has forgotten. I'll be with you every inch of the way, all the way. Good luck to you. All right, Sergeant, show them to their quarters. <laughs> This was a superior group, but only superiority could absorb the intense schedule Sharkey put them through. Communications, photography, the use of knives, guns, poison, map making, cryptography, judo, sketching, meteorology. You're going to hear some sound effects. Identify the sound and write it down. All right, proceed. What was it? A freight train or a 155-millimeter shell passing overhead? All right, next, next. Write your answer. A door latch or the cocking of a 45 caliber pistol. Come on, next, next. What was it? 
a jungle bird or a falling bomb. Part of your training during the past few weeks has been in pairs. It's important to learn which of you can work together best. You're to be sent out now in pairs for practical tests and espionage. The following teams will report to my office in 20 minutes. J.L. Sheffield and Suzanne de Beaumont. Albert Fremont and Harry Gluck. William O'Connell and Jeff Lassiter. Yes? Lassiter and O'Connell are here, sir, for instructions. Send them in. <laughs> O'Connell and Lassiter. You two have lived together. You ought to be able to work together. I think so, sir. O'Connell here is the best. Thanks, Jeff. That goes for me, too. Well, as long as you're so happy about each other, suppose you tell me what this is. This apparatus on the table. A uh, torpedo detonator? Yeah. Here's your assignment. Go to a plant that makes this detonator. Get jobs there. Find out what its specific advantages are over the old type. Get all secret data possible. That means blueprints, drawings, or photographs. Any questions? Yes, sir. Are we to go to the submarine base at Portsmouth or the one in New London? Take your choice, O'Connell. They're both very well guarded, but that shouldn't pose any great difficulty for a couple of bright boys like you. Uh, how much time will we have, sir? Wire me when you've gotten jobs. After that, you'll have 72 hours. 72 hours? You heard me. Get going. Yes? Mr. Sharkey to see you, Mr. Gibson. Oh, send him in. I thought I'd let you know that 77's back from their field work. How'd they do? Okay. I had to tear a couple of them out of the arms of the FBI. <laughs> but the average is good. Well, who gets the gold star? Lasseter and O'Connell. Five beautiful pictures of the torpedo detonator in New London. Here. Yeah. Whoa. Hey, that's excellent work, Bob. Yeah. Too good. Too good. The man who helped get these pictures is the German agent, William O'Connell. What makes you so sure? Am I right? Yes, you're right. How'd you figure it? Well, he stood at the head of his class all the way. That was the lead. It's simply a case of doing everything perfectly too many times. He's too quick for a beginner. Yesterday at the submarine base, Lassiter went into a torpedo shed between shifts and got these pictures. O'Connell stood watch outside, but there was a guard in the shed and Lassiter got caught. O'Connell saw what had happened and came in. Now an American would have slugged the guard, not O'Connell. Instead, he posed as a security agent and slugged Lassiter, congratulated the guard, and went off with his uh, prisoner. Ten minutes later, they were on a train. It's all there in the report. O'Connell's real name is Kunzel. Kunzel, eh? Mm. Well, when are you going to pick him up? We're not going to pick him up. He must never know he's suspected. He's after something big, Bob, or it wouldn't be Kunzel. Information on our organization? Oh, it's bigger than that. The uh, second front? Yeah, that's my guess. Where and when. Oh, how they'd love to know that. Now, our job's arranging for Kunzel to get information. The wrong information. And our plan must also provide a logical way for him to escape. We're dealing with a very smart operator. And when do we start? Tomorrow. You and I and Group 77 are leaving for London tomorrow. <laughs> battle-weary, London was still the hub of all Allied intelligence operations. But top-secret groups like 77 were billeted in the remote countryside and held in complete isolation while awaiting specific assignments across the channel. Assignments like the one that Robert Sharkey laid in the lap of his star pupil, William O'Connell. Well, there's no doubt about it, Bill. You see, I've checked up on what you've told me. Yes, you know Holland, all right. Well, I lived in Holland long enough. All of a sudden, Holland's become a pretty hot spot on our maps. Second front? I'm sorry, I have no right to ask questions. Yes. Yes, I think it it may be Holland, except what I think doesn't count. We just obey orders. I need help. You want a job? I didn't go through all that training to become an English country gentleman. Pack your gear. You're going back to London. You're to live and work there in tight security. That security begins now. Clear? Clear. No goodbyes, nothing. And not a word to anybody, anyone about what I've mentioned. I understand. I think you'll like it. Anyway, we pull out of here the first thing in the morning. Thank you, sir. So 
did William O'Connell suddenly drop from sight as far as his fellow members of Group 77 were concerned. From the head of the Dutch intelligence, O'Connell learned every phase of a proposed Allied invasion through Holland. Meanwhile, in another section of London, Robert Sharkey has called in two other agents, Jeff Lassiter and Suzanne de Beaumont. You're late, Suzanne. When I say 0600, I mean 0600. I stopped by the communication section. Why? They've been trying to help me locate my husband. Your husband's whereabouts are not the slightest concern of Group 77. Do you understand that? Yes. I understand. You know the rules. All right, now. Assignments have come through for the two of you here. Take a look at these photographs. Hitler's secret weapon, except it's no longer a secret. You can't a bomb. And what a bomb. It's called a V-2. A self-propelled pilotless bomb with a warhead said to contain a ton of explosive. Now look at these pictures. These are launching platforms for the V-2. For months they've been springing up along the French coast, faster than our planes can knock them out. Why haven't the Germans used them yet? We think we know why. The enemy knows there's going to be a second front. They don't know where or when... But they do know the invasion base is in the Southampton area. When they launch V-2, it's going to be a sustained barrage smothering Southampton. When do you think they will stop? As soon as General Eisenhower makes his move. The Nazis know they can't win the war. They're just hoping for a stalemate. And to achieve a stalemate, they've got to prevent an invasion. Well, our job is to try and help the Allied High Command gain the preciously needed time to complete the invasion buildup. Lassiter, you're going to France. Yes, sir. You're going with him, Suzanne. You'll be his radio communicator. Yes, sir. Now, let's get back to this map. The most closely guarded area in all France is right here. This is the main assembly area of V2. But to destroy this target, we have to know every detail of its construction. Even the French underground has not been able to get this for us, so we're stymied. Thoroughly stymied. Except for one vitally important lead. Now, forget the map... And look at this photograph. This face. This name. Marcel Duclois. A very important man to the Germans. Burn that face into your memory because the destruction of the target is linked to that one man. Marcel Duclois. And what's Duclois' connection with V2? He, a Frenchman, designed and built the bomb depot. We must take Luc Duclois and take him alive. <laughs> How about some coffee, Suzanne? No, thank you, Jeff. If I am to be your communicator, I'd better spend some time with the receiving office. It will help them become familiar with my thoughts. Yeah, I guess you're right. Someday, maybe we will have time for coffee. Excuse me, please. Mr. Simpson. Oh, Madame de Beaumont. I, I hate to keep troubling you, oh, it's but... no trouble. There's still no word of your husband. Thank you. However, we've contacted an agent in the La Havre area. You'll be informed as soon as we hear. Mr. Sharkey's orders. Mr. Sharkey? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Morning, Jeff. Oh, uh, close the door, will you? Yes, sir. Understand you met your friend Bill O'Connell this afternoon at the campaign. <laughs> Was I glad to see him. The way he dropped out of sight, I didn't know what had happened to him. What'd you talk about, Jeff? Oh, backgammon, mostly. Backgammon? Uh-huh. We used to play all the time back in Washington. I owe him $12 million. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, did he mention what he's been working on? No, sir, he didn't. He did say he wished I'd be going with him. How do you feel about that? Well, I wish I were, too. You mentioned your assignment to him? No, sir, of course not. Now, take it easy. I'm not accusing you. Jeff, your friend O'Connell is an agent of the German government. He is? His real name is Kunzel. He's a clever, thoroughly trained German secret agent. But you... You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. I can't believe it. Anyway, O'Connell has been assigned to Holland. That's the clincher to all the phony information we have purposely allowed him to obtain. Holland? Yes, the invasion of Holland. That's the lie we're trying to sell to the German high command. And Kunzel, alias O'Connell, is the salesman. Well, uh, where do I come in? Kunzel has asked for you. 
We're going to send you with him. Well, what about Ducroix? That's still your mission. Only you'll go to France by way of Holland. How? You'll be parachuted into Rotterdam along with O'Connell. You'll contact a man there named Wolfert Bachmann in the Department of Public Works. Bachmann will see that you and Suzanne get through safely to France. Suzanne? Yes. You'll be on your way within 48 hours. Now comes the rugged part. Yes, sir. We think O'Connell is sold. If we're right, he'll disappear as soon as you're in Rotterdam and you'll never see him again. Could he know anything about Ducroix? I mean, what our real job is? Not unless he gets it from you and Suzanne. He won't. Never, never forget that you're dealing with an extremely clever man. Drop your guard for one minute, and we'll have failed, and you may be dead. Yes, sir. You think fast, Jeff. He's ruthless. That's why we're going to do this his way. His way? What's that? If O'Connell is not sold, if he should in any way suspect that you're on a double mission, he won't disappear. Instead, he'll try to follow you. And you will shoot him. Shoot him? Make sure it's for keeps. That's, uh, that's rough. That's war, and that's your mission. O'Connell could do it. Can you? Yeah. I... I can do it. Thanks, Jeff. That's all for now. Better check your parachute, Suzanne. You too, Jeff. Pilot says we'll be over Rotterdam in ten minutes. Okay. Suzanne, I want to tell you how sorry I am about your husband. Thank you. What a rotten break getting that news about him just before we took off. If it had to come, I'm glad it came then. There will not be time to cry about it now. Yeah. Maybe it's just as well you're not going back to France. Phil, if you do not mind. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Approaching the target. It's got about three minutes. Thanks. Well, Jeff, this is what we used to talk about back in Washington. Our first jump into enemy territory. Yeah. Feel like you thought you would? Yeah. You know something? What? I don't believe you. What's the matter with you? Nothing. Sure there is. You've been looking at me like, like I was in a test tube. Sorry, I guess I'm just a little nervous. Yeah. I'm nervous. Drop your guard for one minute, and you may be dead. Drop your guard, and you may be dead. We're over the target. Action station. You may be dead. Jeff, what's the matter? Huh? Oh, uh, nothing. You know that 12 million bucks you owe me, Jeff? I'm wiping it off the books. Yeah. What? 12 million anyway. I'd never have time to spend it. We're even, Jeff. We'll start from scratch. Money in. Now clear the jump hole. First, miss? Yes, I'm first. Last of the next, and I'm last. Already, miss. Good luck. Thank you. See you below. Jump. Message for you, Mr. Sharkey. Well, who from? The Rotterdam plane. Go ahead. To Beaumont and O'Connell dropped over target. Lassiter's parachute failed to open. Static cord deliberately cut. Believe O'Connell responsible. Static cord deliberately. Get me Mr. Gibson on the phone immediately. Our stars will return in Act Two of 13 Rue Madeleine in a moment. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. Act three of 13 Rue Madeleine, starring Robert Montgomery as Bob Sharkey, Lloyd Nolan as Gibson, Richard Conte as Colonel Kunzel, and Vanessa Brown as Suzanne. In the seaport city of La Havre, the Gestapo headquarters for the heavily fortified coastal area was located at 13 Rue Madeleine. That evening, shortly before 7 o'clock, a staff car and a truckload of soldiers roared out of 13 Rue Madeleine and headed down the road for pont Lebec. In the staff car, as we subsequently learned, was Colonel Kunzel. 
Meanwhile, in Pont Levesque. Look at them, Captain Freitas. That mob out there, they'll kill me. Those fools. Don't they know what this means? I told them time and again they must never assemble. But why haven't your soldiers come? You called them ten minutes ago. That phone call I made, that was not to the hotel. Not to the hotel. I called the R. Colonel Quintzel is on his way here. He's greatly interested in your town, Mayor Gallimard. Listen to them. They blame me because I have tried to help you bring some order to this town. I must be protected. The troops are not to leave the hotel except in extreme emergency. What do you think this is? The people know why that man came here from Vichy, that Mr. Chavard. I have already bred this town for workmen. You know I have. Where is he now? Chavard. He has disappeared. They've killed him. Just as they killed me. Here you see. They're throwing guns. Guns. They've got guns. Now we will you do something? This is Captain Freitas. Get me the Hotel Model. I will talk to the people. You think I'm a coward, but I know my duty. Go back to your houses. You are breaking the law. There will only be trouble. You must go back to your houses. Return to your homes. Return to your homes. Yes, correct. That's clerk. That idiot. Where has he gone? I, I do not know, Captain Freitag. I, I thought you were the city hall, Captain. Who are you? Me, Captain? Well, if I have the, the night porter. Where's the desk clerk? Where's the elevator operator? What are you doing in the elevator? Well, the, the, the soldiers are all shot a little while ago. He gives me a chance to clean the elevator. Get out of there. But if the clerk is gone, who is going to pay me my wages? I don't know. Come back later. I need my wages. I'm a poor I man. I to get out of the elevator. No. I will not leave until you give me my wages. Get out before I... Monsieur, all clear. Monsieur. Pick up your knife. You may need it again. Yes, monsieur. The... This clerk and the sergeant. I've taken care of them. Who else might be here? The night detail. They're asleep on the third floor, perhaps eight of them. Du quoi? I found him, monsieur. Huh? Second floor, room 210. Marcel Du Huh? What is it? Who are you? Come with me. No. No. Who are you? Why do you point a gun at me? The resistance has taken over the town. You'll be better off with me. But the guards! The guards! The soldiers have gone to the city hall. There's a riot. Come on, Dubois. It's all farming country, Colonel Consul. <laughs> Very pleasant in the moonlight. Well, the arrive in Port in ten minutes. Whatever's going on in that town, Major, is more than a mere outbreak of the French resistance. Somehow it's all tied in with... Stop the car. Can you consul? Wait a minute. Turn out your headlights. Signal that truck to stop. Yes, Herr Colonel. Major, don't you hear anything? Uh, a plane? Yeah, a plane. You have it? By one plane? No, I don't think so. Look, it's a flashlight. Now look below there in that valley. Uh-huh, landing lights. They're signaling to that plane. That's an 077 landing operation, Major. The plane is either landing someone, which I doubt exceedingly, or picking someone up. Get back in the car and rush for that field. We're coming in, 077. We're coming in. How is it down there? Wind, 90 degrees. Velocity, 2 zero. Wind, 90 degrees. It's our pickup already. Everything is ready. Hurry, please. Get on the field. On the field. There may be trouble. We just spotted two cars on the road in back of One may be a troop truck. They extinguish their lights. All right. Here we come. Emil, take Lucroix. Get him out on that field. Shove him in that plane the second it lands. Then go for cover. The automobile, look. A Nazi staff car. Hurry, get him out there. The plane's landing. Where are you going? I'm taking Emil's car. I can block the road. For a little while, anyway. Blow up your radio, Suzanne, and then get out of here. The plane's landing here, Colonel. Cut across the field. Impossible, Herr Colonel. This is an irrigation deal. Well, then go faster. Turn on your lights. It doesn't matter now. 300 yards. We'll make it all right. What a find this may turn out to be. A reunion, perhaps, with an old friend. A hand could have been there on the field. Five or six only. I want them all, you understand? Preferably alive. Yeah, Colonel, the car is coming. Don't slow down. He won't pull over. He'll pull over. Keep going. Keep... Captain 
Consul. Colonel Consul. Are you all right? I'm all right. What happened? When the cars crashed, you were knocked out for a moment. The plane got away? Yes, but if there's some way of contacting the house, perhaps they could intercept the plane. Never mind. Where's the car that crashed into us? Back there in the ditch. And the driver? He couldn't have got far. We're rounding them all up now. But find them. Find the driver of that car. Look through every foot of this. Look out! Look out! I got him. Over there in the brush. He's still alive, Colonel. Unconscious. He must not die. Corporal, go into Pont Levesque and get a doctor at once. Yes, Air Colonel. It's not a bad wound. He will live. Then all our luck didn't desert us tonight. This man with persuasion will tell us everything we want to know. This man is Robert Sharkey. Sharkey? Then who was in that plane? My guess would be Marcel Ducroix. We'll soon know. Air Colonel, in his hand, a little white capsule. Mm. An L pill. Death in one minute. Tough break, Sharkey. Always so sure of yourself. <laughs> Marcel Ducroix was delivered to my office sometime after midnight. We were waiting for him. Air Corps officers and intelligence. Once Ducroix realized he wasn't going to be tortured and killed, he gave us a whole story. Just one more question, Ducroix. Look at the map. This area is a grain field. How far is it exactly from the river to the depot? No guess, Ducroix. If you don't know, say so. If I don't know, monsieur, I am an ingenieur. From the river to the depot... Twelve kilometers point two seven. That's all we need to know, Mr. Gibson. Take him out, Captain. French intelligence wants him upstairs. Well, Gibson, we know now where the V-2 depot is. Every detail of its construction. You can be very proud of your organization. I want to thank you for your cooperation. Right. Now it's our job. Good night. Good night. Good night, sir. I beg your pardon, Mr. Gibson? Oh, yes, Simpson. Come inside, please. Communications and contact with Suzanne de Beaumont. Howdy, It's Suzanne, all right. Listen. Have not much time. Sharky taken alive to Gestapo headquarters. The hall. Taken alive? Sharky ordered me out. I could not make it. Soldiers have surrounded farmhouse. And hear them closing in. Don't worry. I will not be taken alive. Please tell this to me. I... <laughs> Two questions, Sharky, that's all. Just two questions. Where is the invasion coming, and when? I'm sorry, Consul. I don't know. I'm sorry, too. I'm sorry you make it necessary to go to these ends. But believe me, we've only started. I believe you. But I can't tell you what I don't know. You do know. We'll continue to use any means we can to make you talk. Show them what I mean, Sergeant. <laughs> Don't stop, Sergeant. <laughs> you see, Sharky, we'll make you tell. A man can take so much punishment. Remember what you taught me? Fair play, years of decency, that's out. You've done your job, now I'll do mine. Where will the invasion take place? <laughs> Have you got a map? Let him go, Sergeant. Over here, Sharky. Where on the map? Where? Right here. Strike the colonel, will you? Strike the colonel. Stop it. You want to kill him? We'll try again later. We didn't know then what was happening to Sharky, but we could imagine. Poor Suzanne, she at least was dead. But Sharky... We planned the one move. The one move that could help. At ease, men. You pilots have been assembled for a most special mission. Your target is there on the wall. One city, the Havre. One street in that city. One building on that street. 13 Rue Madeleine. Take a good look. The landmarks are well defined. The bay, surrounding hills. Take a good look and remember it. This has got to be a job of total destruction. Not a wall left standing. No one must escape from that house alive. No one. 
You'll go in four squadrons. Two dropping high explosives, followed by two squadrons at minimum intervals to smother the entire target with rockets and machine gun fire. You've been given the route of approach. Time over target, 0300. Bombers will go in at zero feet. Zero feet. I know. Hey, I know. It's tough. Any questions? Well, uh, Colonel, uh, I think... Well, I think we'd kind of like to know who's in that house. Gehring, maybe? Or Hitler? Or who? I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to answer that. Well, perhaps in a way I can. Mr. Gibson? I know that this is a tough assignment. You'll be risking your life. You... That house is the headquarters of the German Gestapo in La Havre. Now, that's an important reason for destroying it, but it's not the only reason. There's an American agent in that house. He knows the when and where of our invasion of the country. Now, if he talks, it may co cost the lives of countless soldiers. Right now, he's suffering the cruelest tortures the Germans can devise, but he won't talk, not as long as he can stand punishment. But no human body can stand it too long. Not even this wonderful, tough guy from Minnesota. So I'm... I'm asking you to kill my friend as soon as you can. If you're ready, men, we'll synchronize our watches. Ready to talk, Sharky? Sharky, are you ready to talk? No. No. The air raid, the Colonel. Do you think? Keep beating him. Those planes won't bother us here. They'll be heading for the waterfront. The building's been hit, I told you. The lights are on. Make him talk. Make him talk. You're too late, Consul. You're too late. <laughs> Flight Commander to Gibson. Flight Commander to Gibson. This is Gibson. Go ahead. Target obliterated. Target obliterated. That's all, Simpson. Why don't you go to bed now, sir? You haven't slept Yes. Hours. Yes, I think I will. Oh, take a message to Washington, please. No, no, you don't have to write it down. Just say... Mission completed. The curtain falls on 13 Rue Madeleine, and in a moment we'll call our four stars to the footlights for a curtain call. A thrilling play like 13 Rue Madeleine is always enhanced by brilliant acting. And that's what we had tonight from Bob Montgomery, Lloyd Nolan, Richard Conte, and Vanessa Brown, who returned to the footlights for a curtain call. <laughs> Bob, since you were last here, you've become a rare phenomenon in Hollywood. Well, I hope you mean that better than it sounds, Bill. <laughs> I mean as an actor who directs and stars in his own picture. Well, having acted in the first film that Bob directed, I can say that he's as capable behind the camera as he is in front of it. I've always wondered just how does an actor direct himself? Well, first of all, you do the best you can in front of the camera. And then you step behind it and boil yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> I see you've had experience with directors, Vanessa. Don't you ever talk back to yourself, Bob, uh, on the set, that is? Well, when I'm out in front of the camera, I don't dare affront the guy who's fronting for myself behind the camera, but... When I moved from behind the camera to the front... Wait a minute, where am I? Sounds like you were on a merry-go-round. Well, that's more or less so if Bob's talking about his latest Universal International picture, Ride a Pink Horse, which takes its title from a carousel. Thanks for getting me out of that confusion, Bill. I trust, Vanessa, you had no such confusing problems in your current picture, Foxes of Harrow. Oh, uh, what kind of foxes are those, Vanessa? 20th century foxes, foxes. <laughs> well, tally ho. I'll join the hunt for the nearest theater where it's playing. But tell us, Bill, what's coming up for next week? Uh, next Monday night, we bring our audience a fresh, unusual screenplay that's achieved worldwide acclaim. Universal International's delightful drama, 
Stairway to Heaven. And our stars are Ray Milland, Anne Blythe, and Nigel Bruce. Stairway to Heaven is the tender story of a British pilot in love with a young American girl who fights for the right to live and love against the adverse powers of another world. That was one of the most original screenplays of the season, Bill. Your audience is lucky. Good night, Bill. Good night, and thanks night. for the visit night. to Rue Madeline. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ray Milland, Anne Blythe, and Nigel Bruce in Stairway to Heaven. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Thank uh-huh.